Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. The results are in. Over 700 pieces of UFO debris, or spherules as they are called, have now been analyzed in detail, both chemically and under an electron microscope, and the results are surprising to say the least. They do not correspond to any sort of material that we would find in nature in our solar system, nor do they correspond to anything that we manufacture with our own technology. So what are they? All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon. Once again, welcome to The Angry Astronaut. Want to give you guys a quick reminder on the 3rd of September, that is to say on Sunday, yes, in the middle of the Labor Day weekend, but that is the day of my Pittsburgh event. It's taking place at the Moonshot Museum in Pittsburgh uh, from 2 to 5 p.m. Details in the description if you are interested in attending. And of course, a ticket to the event also entitles you to a copy of my book, Okay, let's go ahead and move on to the exciting news. For those of you unfamiliar with everything that was involved in the Galileo Project's expedition off the coast of New Guinea, well, I'm going to give you a really, really quick review. And if you want something a little bit more in-depth, well, I have other videos on the topic linked at the end of this one. In 2014, a meteor encountered our planet. It was traveling too fast to be a meteor that came from within the solar system. It was traveling at a speed that was substantially greater than that of solar system escape velocity, meaning that there's no way that it could have come from within the solar system. That is according to the US military and to some classified reports essentially the various sensing devices, radar, etc., that they use to pick up these sorts of things, and the military has stood behind the results. They are saying with a 99.999% level of confidence that this was an interstellar meteor. It did not come from within the solar system. However, even at that speed, the meteor managed to achieve a low enough altitude before it broke up to suggest that it was made out of a very resilient material. Indeed, the most resilient material of any meteor that has ever encountered our planet, at least according to the JPL's records on such things. They have nearly 400 meteors on file, and this particular meteor, given how fast it was going and that it was only about a meter in diameter, it should have broken up much higher up in the atmosphere than it did again suggesting that it was made out of a much more resilient material than just nickel iron, which is very strange indeed. And that's what led Avi Loeb and his expedition to go off the coast of New Guinea with a privately funded expedition and dredge the bottom of the seafloor with a magnetic sledge that would pick up any magnetic pieces, that is to say any metallic pieces that they might find on the bottom of the ocean, hoping that they would find fragments of this meteor. Well, they found dozens of what they call spherules, tiny little fragments of metallic fragments, that is, that have been superheated and changed by the experience. That is to say, they traveled through the atmosphere, were heated to several thousand degrees, and what came out of that were these little fragments called spherules. We find them in the aftermath of conventional meteorite impacts, so this was expected to be found at this location at the bottom of the ocean off the coast of New Guinea. However, the composition of these spherules was very unusual indeed, so they took them back, had them examined in great detail, and what they found is unbelievable because it definitely confirms that whatever this object was, it came from outside our solar system, and it may have been artificial and not natural. In the course of this video, I'm going to be quoting extensively from a paper entitled Discovery of Spherules of Likely Extrasolar Composition in the Pacific Ocean Site of the CNEOS 2014-0108, or IM1. Now, what all of that refers to is just the first 
suspected interstellar meteor that's ever been detected, and why its composition proves that it came from outside the solar system and it might not have been a meteor at all. The study begins thusly, quote, We have conducted an extensive towed magnetic sled survey during the period of June 14th through June 28th of 2023 over the seafloor about 85 kilometers north of Manus Island, Papua New Guinea, and found about 700 spherical in diameter of 0.05 to 1.3 millimeters, so very, very small, and about 57 of these have been analyzed. Approximately a quarter of a kilometer of seafloor was sampled in the survey, centered around the calculated path of the IM-1 meteor, so they know where the debris path was, where they suspected that the thing crashed, and so they not only searched that part of the seafloor, but also a control area just outside the debris path just to see if the same sort of spherules were to show up there as well. If they did, it would prove that they did not come from this object. However, they found the spherules only in the debris path and not in the control area. The sled that they used weighed 200 kilograms and was equipped with 300 magnets mounted on both of its sides and video cameras mounted on the tow halter. The ship that towed it, by the way, was named the Silver Star. After several experimental runs, the sled actually wasn't working properly. It was kiting above the seafloor, so to mitigate this, they added 50 kilograms of lead to the sled. After that, it worked a lot better. They towed it for an average of about eight hours per run. Debris was then gathered, and then they would make another run after that. And the composition analysis that was done initially suggested that there was a lot of iron in these spherules, as one would expect expect in a nickel iron meteor, but no nickel and a lot of other trace elements that don't show up in meteorites either. However, they decided to have the spherules analyzed in much greater detail by the best instruments in the world within Harvard University, UC Berkeley, the Bruker Corporation, and the University of Technology in Papua New Guinea, whose vice chancellor signed a memorandum of understanding with Harvard University for partnership on the expedition research. But it was the analysis performed by Stein Jacobson and his Cosmochemistry Laboratory team at Harvard University that revealed the most unique characteristics of these spherules, and these were gathered in the high-yield regions of IM-1's path, that is to say where the most spherules were detected, and they show a composition of elements that do not correspond to anything inside our solar system, a composition unlike anything that has ever been found in the past. Aside from the obvious iron, these particular spherules were enriched with beryllium, lanthanum, and uranium, which were not found in any meteorite samples in the past. Very unusual indeed, and completely inconsistent with any nickel-iron meteors that one would find within our solar system. They were a pattern called BELAU. Now, for you aerospace engineers out there, you would know that beryllium is a common metallic element used for aerospace material because of its high flexural rigidity thermal stability, and thermal conductivity, along with a low density. In other words, a very resilient metal and a very lightweight one at that. However, it's never used in conjunction with these other elements, especially uranium. Now, lanthanum has no commercial uses as a metal, but its alloys have a variety of uses. For example, if you combine lanthanum and nickel, that's used to store hydrogen gas for use in hydrogen-powered vehicles. However, there was no nickel in these samples. Lanthanum is also found in the anode of nickel metal hydride batteries used in hybrid cars. Again, no nickel in these samples, so that doesn't make any sense either. Indeed, according to the study, quote, the BELAU elemental abundance pattern does not match terrestrial alloys, fallout from nuclear explosions, magma ocean abundances of Earth 
or its moon or Mars or other natural meteorites in the solar system. This supports the interstellar origin of IM-1 independently of the measurement of its high speed as reported in the CNEOS catalog and confirmed in an official letter to NASA from U.S. Space Command. Since IM-1 spherules melted off the surface of the object, the enhanced beryllium abundance may represent a flag for cosmic ray spallation on IM-1 surface along an extended interstellar journey through the Milky Way galaxy. This constitutes a fourth indicator of an interstellar origin for IM-1, in addition to its high speed, its heavy element composition, and its iron isotope ratios. The BELAU abundance pattern could potentially be explained if IM-1 originated from a highly differentiated crust of an exoplanet with an iron core. In that case, IM-1's high speed of 60 kilometers per second in the local standard of rest in the Milky Way galaxy and the extremely large number of similar objects per star, 10 to the power of 23 inferred statistically for the population of meter-sized interstellar objects, are challenging to explain by comic dynamical processes. What does all of that mean? Well, it means that even if it did form naturally, the odds of something like this just happening to stumble across our planet out of all of the places that it could have passed through throughout the entire galaxy suggests that there must be a tremendous number of similar objects throughout the galaxy, which there doesn't appear to be. Again, Avi Loeb is indirectly suggesting that this object originated from another solar system, but it's here by design, not by random happenstance. And by the way, this is something that Avi Loeb concludes at the end of his article, quote, A more exotic possibility is that this unfamiliar abundance pattern, with uranium being nearly a thousand times more abundant than the standard solar system value, may reflect an extraterrestrial technological origin. And by the way, this is the explanation that Dr. Loeb favors, because the odds of something this exotic with this unusual combination of elements, even if it did come from a solar system where this sort of thing is common, the odds of it hitting us by random chance are unbelievably unlikely. And it seems far more likely that this was an artificial object, perhaps a probe of some kind, similar to Voyager or New Horizons that was coming here by design with a directive to explore any planets that might be orbiting in a sun's Goldilocks zone. That seems far more likely, but once again, it's going to take a lot more research and a lot more testing to determine if this particular combination of elements, together with the volatiles that may have burned off in the atmosphere, that's a missing piece of this puzzle, by the way, will be interesting to determine if this combination of elements might have some practical technological application that we have yet to figure out. But one thing is certain, an interstellar object of some kind hit our planet off the coast of New Guinea in 2014. We have, for the first time, found debris from an interstellar object. We have it in our laboratories right now, and we're studying it. And the core of this object may have still survived its passage through the atmosphere. Only another expedition off the coast of New Guinea can determine this, and I have a feeling Dr. Loeb is going to secure the funding for that, given how exciting the initial results of his first expedition have been. I'll continue to bring you new developments from this ongoing investigation as they happen. In the meantime, please like, please subscribe. It's very important to the success of my channel. And also please check the description for various ways to support this content so I can keep bringing it to you. And as always, stay angry about space.